Hi everyone, welcome back to episode 2 of the Journey to a Metal series where I take you through my experience of trying to play badminton whilst working full time, trying to incorporate training and recovery as well as tournament play, which is my first tournament in the last two years. Also in episode 1 I show you the wide range of badminton grades available in England as well as my own badminton grade and besides that I also showed you why I decided to only go for singles in the tournament that I've signed up for alongside my honest training diary with a free training planner that you can download for free from our website at ckyw.com forward slash shop. By the way you can also check out the premium racket rotation tapes for your rackets too whilst you're there. If you haven't watched the first episode go check it out here. In today's episode I'll be focusing on the training that I've gone through to prepare myself for the upcoming tournament. Obviously we would all love to be able to play like Li Zijia, Victor Axelsen, Tai Ziying and An Se Young in singles but that's not realistic and there's no denying that they've put in years of years of consistent incredible hard work hence this is why they're so so good at badminton. And seeing that I only had 9 weeks of training available to me before I play my tournament, I decided to split my training into 3 separate categories to focus on. On court training, strength and conditioning or SNC and endurance. Let me start with my endurance training. In episode 1 I told you I measured my baseline endurance in terms of number of sets I was able to play at full speed and intensity and I wasn't able to last a single set. A single set in my opinion is about 40 rallies and say even if you win 2010 that's still 30 rallies. So I've timed it to an average of 20 seconds work and about 30 to 40 seconds rest per rally. So that kind of set the benchmark of my starting point. Endurance isn't something that can be developed overnight but over 9 weeks there is hope for improvement for me. I tried to ensure there was some form of endurance work within my week. Sometimes it would be running which I tried to keep it within zone 4 heart rate which is at about 80 to 90% of your, of your max heart rate. Other days I incorporate shadows into my gym workouts. Shadows are a great way to increase your on-court endurance as well as improving your movement quality and patterns. I normally have about 20 seconds work, 35 seconds rest, 20 sets per round. Within that I split them into say 4 sets where I try and reach everything high, 4 sets where everything is low, 4 sets focusing on trying to get behind the imaginary show as fast as I can and attack it and I additionally did my shadows at the start of my gym sessions but then decided to switch it up and do them at the end of my session to replicate the tiredness that you would have after a few sets. You can mix it as much as you like and focus on what works for you. Another endurance training I did when I wasn't able to do my run or shadows was actually do on court consistency training. I set a timer for say 1 minute or a minute 30 seconds and then set up a closed yeah, yeah. routine like a drop and net and repeat that for the whole duration. Focus on not making mistakes and slowly tighten up your shot quality and repeat this for a few sets and you'll quickly find how hard this is. The second type of training I focused on was strength and conditioning. This is an area I'm extremely weak at and it's a significant limiting factor for my game. If you can't get to the shuttle quick enough or get it out under pressure, then you've lost the rally. Faster, better, stronger is a real asset in badminton. It's so crucial. If you look at all the top players in any categories, they are incredibly strong and resilient. So it's a goal to be stronger so I can play better. And with only 9 weeks available before the tournament I want to focus on building strength and I really like compound exercises so I focus on those which are suited to badminton. Your traditional squats, deadlifts, bench press and military presses were all regular features for me. But after having chatted to a colleague of mine, Fee, who was a professional player until very recently, she then designed a plan for me which included exercises such as pogo hops, med ball slams, single leg Romanian deadlifts and fast feet onto my routines. These elements 
movements then added some explosiveness and stability onto my training, which is something I lacked. So for example, a gym session for me would look like this. Get to the gym and have a five minute warm up on the treadmill or elliptical machine. I then do my dynamic stretches for the exercises I was gonna do, and then going to skipping. A hundred for both legs, then a hundred single leg, each before another 100 on both legs. After that, if it's a squat day, I'll then be supersetting it with some dumbbell lateral shoulder raises. I love supersetting exercise because I find myself saving time, and if I'm working different muscle groups, I can cope okay. After that, I then go straight onto something like a single leg RDL, Romanian and deadlift, and again, superset that with some bicep curls. I can then do some shoulder shrugs, which is then again superset with some rotator cuff exercises before ultimately moving on to some overhead med ball slams, again supersetting with some side lunge med ball throws. I always end with core exercises before having a good static stretch. For my static stretches, I normally have an interval timer with me, which will hold for 35 seconds and have 10 seconds to switch positions. My normal routine have about 15 to 20 stretches, so I think it's pretty thorough for me. I previously did a video on warm-ups and cool-downs, including some of the stretches that I did, and you can check it out here. If you're asking how long does that normally take, um, about an hour 45 minutes to two hours. If I'm really in a rush, I'll focus on a big compound exercises such as squats and deadlifts before doing something for the upper body or shoulders, then ending it with core. I never skip core workouts as well as the warm-up and cool-down. Being strong is one way to ensure you don't get injured, but you can cut your gym session down to an hour if you get into a good routine. I've also noted the quieter times for my gym, so I try and go during those times too. Again, I've listed these workouts on my training diary and planner, so they've been updated through to week six, so download it for free at ckwb.com forward slash shop and follow along if you'd like. Let's do this together. And finally, the training that probably most of you would be interested in, the encore training. When I first discussed this with my coaches, I really wanted to focus on getting the basics done really well. In the grand scheme of things, nine weeks of training isn't that much, but it can be a good building platform for me to get out of my bad habits and improve my technique and timing. So we decided to really focus on that. Previously, my game was very one-dimensional and not a lot of change of pace, not because I didn't want to, but because I couldn't. And because we're pairing that with the SNC work that I'm doing in the gym, we should see some good results by the end of the nine weeks. The first thing on court that I really wanted to correct was my hitting prep or racket carriage. As I record a lot of footage of myself playing, I was seeing a trend where my racket strings were pointing down to the floor before I start my swing phase. I didn't realize it at the time, but it caused me to mistime a lot of my shots as I then had to raise the racket before starting the forward swinging phase, complicating the timing. Having seen a lot of top pros have their rackets opened up with the rackets straighter, I decided to try it and wow, it was a significant improvement for me because this prep shortened my prep phase, which then I was able to focus on my shots a lot better, which then ended with better accuracy. Additionally, I also noticed my elbow was quite low and close to my body on my previous prep, and we decided to try and move it away from my body as much as I can so I can have a better swing phase. And again, I found this to work really well for me. It's these little things like that we really focused on correcting throughout my on-court training sessions. Essentially, going one step backwards to go two steps forwards in the future. And don't get me wrong, these processes took weeks to even stick properly, and we kept experimenting to make sure it's suitable for me as I've had a short injury before so you have to find what works for you. Similarly in tennis terms if you look at Roger Federer's backhand technique it's incredible but I don't think it's been very effective on anyone else but him. 
so you have to adapt and find something that works well for you. One more key on chord area that we spent a lot of time focusing was the quality of my racket grip timing when I was hitting my shots. For example, you have your normal forehand, backhand grip, universal grip, panhandle grips, etc. But the key thing for me was ensuring I have the right gap within my hands and able to squeeze the handle correctly during my hitting phase. As I really wanted to develop better control and also better deception down the line, this piece of skill was really important. The ability to use my fingers effectively and squeeze the handle with clean, small movements is essential for me to continue this building process. And in episode 1, remember I mentioned I got very tired on my arm and deltoids from the first session of Encore training just by lifting and doing nets. And so I then incorporated my grip strength training and this is what I was practicing on. I was using these training rackets from Yonex as part of my grip strength practice routine. The TR0 is the heavier model which I used at home for this practice. I would simply focus on the finger gripping technique and practice a straight lift shot and a cross squat lift shot on both the forehand and backhand sides. I'll do 100 reps for each shot and at first I couldn't even do 20 reps per shot without my forearms being so tired and having to make sure I have a rest in between. And after all this practice only took me 5-10 to 10 minutes a day so I just kept doing them. However ultimately the key thing here is quality and correct technique. You cannot compromise on this as it's pointless otherwise. In terms of on-court routines, my coaches and I really worked on refining my technique and shot making through relatively simple routines which you can see on my planner. For example, such as backhand straight drop, then pick up the third shot coming back, round the head cross cut shots, forehand cross cut slice drop shots, forehand smash and follow up and some backhand overhead clear techniques. So they're all relatively simple and straightforward. As someone who is older, I certainly learned how to manage my training load a lot better nowadays as I can get carried away and do too much risking injury again. So we'll often start with something more dynamic and explosive before turning it down and doing some more boring static work when I'm getting worn out or too tired. Sometimes we'll even cut certain routines short so that we can have better quality practice and as soon as the quality drops we then adapt and switch our routines. And personally for me I always find making notes of my training really helpful as it helps me remind myself what I needed to do as soon as I step on court. For the first 5 weeks I remember always telling myself open up the wrist, elbow high, loose grip, hold up my racket higher, further away from the chest. You know, it's these little simple things, but they're all bad habits which have accumulated over time. Again, you can download my free training planner on my website at ckyw.com forward slash shop. And lastly, as part of my on-core training, you can see that I have scheduled in game times. For me, I find it really important to be able to play games against different players. The goal of these games is to apply what I have been doing in my training sessions and put them into use in real games. Also, playing a wide variety of players at different levels is also incredibly important to be able to learn how to cope with different playing styles. For example, because I normally play with the same few players in singles such as George or Tom here, when I then played a wider range of players as part of my How Many Levels of Amateur Badminton Are There video, which is coming up by the way, so make sure you get subscribed so you don't miss it. So through these number of games, I then was able to quickly realise I wasn't able to deal with good quality flick serves back then. So I made a note of it and raised it with my coaches and we then worked on how to address this. Another weakness in my game that was also raised from this was my shots were far too flat on many of them, especially clears and lifts. But because they do not have enough height at times, I then put myself under more pressure when I was trying to put my opponents under pressure, wrong shot at the wrong time. So playing a wide range of players is a key item to being able to help you develop your game try that. In the meantime, enjoy your training. I'll be back in the next episode and focusing on the recovery aspect of this series, which is super crucial in this whole process. I'll see you in the next one.